uh, who is um, a professor at FIU in the history department. Um, he's teaching this semester. He's teaching in Broward County Schools. And he won a very prestigious award from the Oral History Association for uh, best and most creative uh, and innovative teaching methods in oral history. Um, we're really, really grateful for the work you do locally and beyond. Um, he is also a historic resident at History Fort Lauderdale. Um, thanks for, for all, <laughs> thank you for everything. And no, no problem. Thanks for taking cool. Thank you, thank you. Can we get the lights? Yep. Thank you. So again, I'm Roberto Fernandez. I go with he, him pronouns. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk to you a little bit about the work that I've done in Broward County. Um, in particular, like what got me into conducting oral histories. Um, so we're going to do like some Broward County black history and then like the crossover of oral history. A um, couple of things that I like to start with is a couple of quotes. And these are like the quotes that I think really um, accentuate like the framework of my practice. Uh, the first one is history is everything that happens in the community. And the quote is by Dr. Cooper Kirk, who was a social studies teacher at Piper High School in Broward County in the 70s into the 80s. He was also Broward County's first official historian. So there's a lot of work out there that he was involved in, like collecting the, the information, conducting oral histories, and publishing works on Broward County history. And so when I remember reading that, I'm like, I love that quote. Like, that's such a good quote. Um, it's also a good reason to talk about a high school history teacher. So, and then of course, um, the African proverb until the lion tells his side of the story, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter, you know, always about perspective. And I think that kind of like looking at everything that happens in our community and then looking at it from multiple perspectives is always very important. And I think that oral history really helps us to explore the nuances and the different perspectives and stuff like that. So a couple of things, um, just kind of like norms that I like to adhere to. I welcome you to speak your truth. You know, so if something comes up during the presentation and you wanna like ask a question, I welcome you to speak your truth. Um, stay engaged. I don't think that's going to be too much of an issue with most of you. Um, embrace discomfort. One of the things that I will be talking about may trigger or hurt or make you cry. And I'm sorry, it's going to be uncomfortable, but it's fact. Um, expect and accept non-closure as a possibility of things that we talk about today. And let's respect the space. All right. So some of the objectives that I have with this presentation, I'm gonna to talk to you first about the historic preservation project at North Woodlawn Cemetery in Fort Lauderdale. I'm going to then kind of talk specifically about Reuben Stacy and the experience with him and the work around his story. And then I'll give you like a little, real little crash course on oral history methods. And that's the packets that I gave most of you. All right, so like to kind of center us in remembering that people of African descent and people within the African diaspora originated from the continent of Africa. And so I like to kind of allow us to remember that there are many African civilizations and that black history does not begin on a transatlantic voyage across the Atlantic. So just recognizing them. All right. So North Woodlawn Cemetery is a historic black cemetery in the city of Fort Lauderdale. Um, it was built around 1920, and we've come up with that time frame based on the headstones that we're able to find. Most of the earliest headstones are from the 1920s. Um, so it's a four acre cemetery. It used to be much bigger in the past when they built I-95 portions of the potter's field of the cemetery were built over with the building of I-95. Um, it is where many, not all, but many of the black pioneers in Fort Lauderdale were initially buried. Um, also where one of the important um, first African-American war heroes for the community of Fort Lauderdale is buried. And his name is Robert Bethel. And he, he is the namesake of the Robert Bethel Post 220, which is on Cistrunk. And so that, that post has been in existence now for 75 years. 
And so, you know, the cemetery has a lot of stories that need to still be uncovered. It started off as a community cemetery. I'm not sure, are any of you guys familiar with um, the concept of like black community cemeteries? So black community cemeteries essentially were organically created. The city of Fort Lauderdale has Evergreen Cemetery, which was platted and it was, you know, the, the land was set aside and allocated specifically to make it a, a burial place for whites. The, the roads and pathways within the cemetery are part of city, the city road network. So every time that the city repaves the roads, guess what gets an upgrade? The roads inside of the cemetery at Evergreen. So community cemeteries, and this is very much true for many of the black cemeteries that I visited throughout Florida, is basically the community finds a space on the edge of town and they start burying their loved ones there. Usually there's some type of uh, community support organization. In the case of Woodlawn, it was a Christian pallbearer society where people kind of paid, you know, a couple of dollars a month as like their insurance policy and that would cover them for burials and, you know, funeral services. And everyone like, there were times I heard through oral histories where people are like, yep, we couldn't pay for that bill, but we sure as hell pay the, the, the pallbearers because, you know, we don't want to mess that one up. So, you know, so Woodlawn is one of those places where the community came, they buried their loved ones. In some cases, um, some of the people that are buried there, we don't know where they're buried, all right? There's no marker, there's no, there's no plat map, there's no list of here's who's buried and when they were buried. There are no records of Woodlawn. And so, the way that I became involved with this was in 2013, the Broward County Historical Commission awarded the Florida Department of Transportation District 4 and the Duras Homeowners Association, so the Homeowners Association around Woodlawn, an award for historic preservation. And so I had some students that were in attendance and were like, hey, is there anything we can do? Because what if they expand 95 and they cut more into the cemetery? And so I was like, I don't know, let's see what we can do. So we got involved with the YMCA 21st century program. So it became like an after school program. And we started doing field trips every month. I took about 14 to 20 kids. We went to Woodlawn, we'd write down the names on the westernmost portion of the cemetery nearest 95. And then it's like, well, we got all these names, but what's their story? And so then how do we find out what the stories are? And so I was like, well, we gotta find a story first, and then we gotta find a way to share the story with the community. So we ended up um, connecting with the Westside Gazette newspaper, which is the historic black newspaper in Fort Lauderdale. It's been in publication for over 50 years. And so the publisher's like, send me the articles and we'll print it, no cost, no problem. So that was our, our main kind of like publication um, place was the Westside Gazette. And so one of the first stories that we did was on Dr. James Franklin's cis trunk. Dr. Sistrunk was, is considered to be the first black doctor in Fort Lauderdale. All right, now I say that because he was, you know, specific, he specifically worked in Broward, but we do know that Dr. Sawyer down here in Miami also likely treated many black patients from Fort Lauderdale. Remember, before Broward County was incorporated, Fort Lauderdale was part of Miami, Miami-Dade. So there's, you know, numerous incidents in the newspaper like, oh, Ivy Stranahan is in the city today. So, so you know, Dr. Sistrunk, um, we found a stone. It was real dirty. We couldn't tell much about it. All we could make out was like some. So we found that. On the property, there's a memorial that the city created in 2000 after the city took over the property. And so they basically asked the community, hey, if there's anybody that's buried here, go ahead and let us know and we will put the name on this memorial. So I've come to discover because I had a student who took pictures of every single plaque and then transcribed that list. And he created the first list that we have of who's buried at Woodlawn. And of course now it's cross-checking and trying to verify what's there, what's not adding and deleting. So Dr. Sistrunk was on the 
you know, the, the memorial that's on the site. We had the stone that basically said cis trunk on it. So, you know, like most people, it's like, okay, I think we've got enough evidence to say that he's buried here. And so we published an article in the West Side Gazette. Then we went to the old Dillard Museum and the uh, historian there is like, uh, I think he's buried actually at Sunset Memorial Gardens. And I remember like panicking. I'm like, oh my God, we just started and we just, I got to print a retraction and I need to figure out how to fix this. And so like that day, like the kids, we got back to school from the museum and I like drove over to the cemetery. I'm like, I need to see where Dr. Sistrunk is buried. And so they found him and they took me out and I'm like, oh crap. So then I like, I talked to the kids, like we stopped all like writing and how do we fix this? because we made a big mistake. And so what we came up with was we will start requesting death certificates. So whenever someone says my family member is buried at Woodlawn, the pro forma first thing that we do is we request a death certificate. I wanna see what the death certificate says. Um, in the case of the Cistrunk stone at Woodlawn, it's actually for his first wife, Daisy Cistrunk. And on the death certificate, when we requested it, it had him listed as husband and then also as the attending physician. I'm like, that's gotta be rough in 1920s Fort Lauderdale, where you're both, you, you like are dealing with the emotion of this is my wife and I've gotta do everything I can and also dealing with the you know, stress of being a doctor. And um, so she ended up passing away. He eventually remarried. His second wife's name is also Daisy, which I was like, eh, at least she won't confuse the names. Um, the kids found it hilarious, like, really? Like, another Daisy? I'm like, yeah, it is what it is. And she, the second wife, was buried with him at Sunset Memorial Garden. So we have the first wife at Woodlawn and the second wife at Sunset. And so, you know, the, the project kind of emerged and we like, I, I published an article after we kind of, to correct the mistake, it, I, I called it a teachable moment. I'm like, we made a mistake, we need to fix this. And so in that article, I said, you know, we're always welcome to other, you know, other perspectives. And if you want to come talk to us, we're ready to listen. And please contact me. And we got one of the first people that contacted us about two or three weeks after the article was published. Like, hey, we live here. We grew up here. We wouldn't mind coming to the school and talking to kids. And so that's how we kind of started getting into the oral history component of the project. Um, so kind of like, as I've described already, the History Across Broward Initiative was a service learning project. I did tie academics to the actual historic preservation piece. My initial intention was to connect students with local history. And I think that local history is something that is severely limited, if not existent in public schools in Florida. And, in Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach, for sure. Um, you know, standards that came out in the last 10 years have sought to like include a little more Florida history, but the real local history is something that is still lacking. So that's one of the objectives that I had. Like, I want the kids to know our community's story. And then also to get the kids to unwittingly engage in the preservation, historical research and writing, because I want them to learn skills too. So it's like, hey, we're gonna do this cool stuff, but I'm gonna low key have you do work so you learn how to do this in the future. Um, so that's, that's it, you know, that, that was the project. And we interviewed in my classroom. This gentleman was from Deerfield Beach. His, um, his family owned several Negro League baseball teams in Broward County. So when people tell me like, oh, there were Negro League baseball teams in Broward, or like, no, there weren't, you know, that, that, that wasn't until later. I'm like, no, we had many. And I've actually, uh, because of his story and his kind of like telling us that story, when I've met descendants of people that played on the Negro League teams in Broward County, I'm like, do you have anything? Do you have a picture? Like, I'd love to be able to tie that to our story. Um, so one of the big, collaborators with us was the Bellamy family. And so here you see Anne Marie, who's the student um, at the head of the table. She's got all of the materials laid out on the desk. Um, and this family came out and they said, yeah, well, our, our father came here from Georgia and he you know, was one of the pioneers. 
and he's buried at Woodlawn and our brother is there and our whole family is there. And so they came and they spoke to us about growing up in Fort Lauderdale, about the stories. And so, you know, we learned about the licenses or the ID cards that were issued to African-Americans that African-Americans had to have in order to be able to be on the east side of the tracks, either before sunrise or after sunset. Um, they told us about um, a lot of just the nuances, like what, what do you do during a hurricane? You know, most of these people lived in, in wood houses. Oh, we'd go to the train station. And one of the things that was like, oh, you know, like we used to love hurricanes because our mom would always make us tea cakes. And it reminded me of like, oh, whenever the lights would go out during a hurricane, we'd always have that, we'd eat the ice cream. It's like, get up, you gotta eat the ice cream. Like, okay, you know. Mm -hmm. I actually did that with my daughters recently um, with Ian, like the lights went out. I'm like, all right, here we go. But, um, you know, so we really got a good insight into, like th they were the real, foot in the door for us to learn about local history, to guide how we did our work, to guide how we find information. Because the books written on black history in Broward County, the first one was published specific to African-American history, was published in 1976. And the, any works about Broward County or Fort Lauderdale history prior to that focused only on the white history. There's very little mentioning of African-Americans. The Seminoles are very much included in the story, but not the African-Americans. And so this was one of the families, they came out with us multiple times. Um, at one point they joined us during Christmas to kind of show us where their father was buried. And they told us, like they walked us up to this really large native ficus aurea in the cemetery and they're like, that's our father's marker the tree. And I was like, wow, that is really cool. And so, you know, I've kind of uh, could never figure out what the name of the tree was. And so I finally got with uh, a botanist who was able to identify it. That's how I can name it now. But then in researching burial practices and funerary practices in African uh, traditional religion, there is, um, there are some tribal groups that use ficus as the tree that is buried as the marker for a person when they're buried. And the growth and the flourishing of the tree or lack of are an indication of how the person is doing in the afterlife. And so I can track using aerial photographs that the county took beginning in the 1950s, I could track the growth of the tree from 1947 when he passed until the last aerial photograph was available. But it was the family and now the big thing is in most of the literature, everyone's like, we know that it exists, but we don't have a name. And so now for me, it's like, okay, the burden of, I gotta get the name out there. I gotta get the photo published, you know, but it was published in the West Side Gazette because the family, you know, the kids wrote a story about it. But, um, you know, again, very, very helpful. I still speak to um, the woman that's in like the track suit, the green track suit. Um, regularly, I, every time I go to the cemetery, I check on the family and the markers and I'm like, hey, they're good. I take a picture and send it to her. I'm like, um, so, you know, the, the buy-in was helpful. And with them, they had a lot of love and respect and appreciation for the story. All right, so that's another picture of us with the family. So one of the stories that we really started with from the very beginning of the project was the story of Reuben Stacy. So Reuben Stacy was an African-American laborer. He lived in Fort Lauderdale. He had a, a home on Third Street in Fort Lauderdale. And the story goes that from the historical documents that he went to the home of Marion Jones asking for water. She turned her back to him uh, to go get him the water and he came in and assaulted her with a pen knife and then when she started screaming and yelling she ran away um huge manhunt for three days in broward county they brought over 50 different black men to the home of marion jones for identification and again according to the newspapers when reuben stacy was presented to marion jones the son was like 
oh, mama, that's the man that done hurt you and ran away, you know, into the yard. The sheriff and the deputy sheriff arrested him, according to the historical accounts, took him to the Broward County Jail because of the tension and hostilities in the community, the sheriff decided that he was going to relocate Reuben Stacy to the jail in Miami. Now he had done this in the past with four defendants from Pompano who were accused of murdering a store owner and taking his money. The sheriff actually used the same thing. The community wanted to lynch those men Sheriff was a brand new, just elected sheriff. He goes, nope, you're not gonna kill them. We're gonna let them go to court. That was in 1933. So Reuben Stacy was lynched on July 19th, 1935, outside of the home of Marion Jones. The young lady in the lower right-hand side right here happened to be in my class, happened to be hanging out with a lot of the students, wasn't one of my direct students when she started. And she was like, oh, I'm interested in some of this stuff and I can get some service hours and I'd love to be here. The article that I had them read mentioned Reuben Stacy. She came to the meeting late because she had another club activity. And so she goes, I'm gonna take this home and I'll read it and I'll come back tomorrow and we can talk about it. I'm like, okay, cool. Took it home, set, you know, put it on the table, told her mom that's my homework. Mother read the article. Chelsea came after showering, sat down, and kind of like, mom's like, I think you're related to somebody in that article. So Chelsea turned out to be the descendant of Reuben Stacy, one of the descendants of Reuben Stacy. I remember she came in the, that morning and she was real early and I was unusually early. And she goes, I read the article. I'm like, okay, cool, what'd you think? Reuben Stacy's my, my, my ancestor. And I'm like, like, hair on the back of the neck, kind of like one of those like, whoa. And so I was immediately like, this is your story to tell. And so of course we requested the death certificate. Um, his death certificate did list lynched by mob and it did say um, shot through heart with bullets. Those are two direct quotes of the death certificate. Um, it's also interesting because what the students are looking at on this desk is the sheriff's arrest index which unfortunately I don't think you can read it too well, but Stacy Rubin, assault to kill, 7-19-35, dead. So I think, this is a hypothesis, that because of all of the attention that this lynching got, if you Google Rubin Stacy, you will find his lynching photos on Google. The photo of, one of the photos of Reuben Stacy I've seen used multiple times in Spike Lee films. Like I know it's in Malcolm X, it's like one of the montage um, photos. The photo was also used by the NAACP to kind of show the community of, of lynching and then also to solicit, hey, we're trying to fight against lynching, send us money. And so his photo was used for that as well. And so, with Reuben, we, we did know, because Chelsea told me that one of her family members was in the house and was a little girl. She was about five years old when the lynching happened. And I was like, well, do you think she'll talk to anybody? And she goes, I don't know, I'll ask. And so this is back in 2013, 2014 that we're having this conversation. And so she goes back, she goes, no, she doesn't want to talk about it. She's like not interested. And even Chelsea's mother was like, no, we're trying to get her to talk to us about it. Cause now that we're talking about it, like she's, you know, she's interested, but she's scared. Other historians they told me had tried to, um, to speak with her and she never shared the story. So, you know, I was like, you know what? I don't need, I'm not pushing this. If you guys want to share it with me, I'm cool with that. If you don't want to share it with me, I'm cool with that too. I want to respect your story. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to publish a book. Um, Cause that's one of the things that they said like, oh, he's going to publish a book. And so, and again, to some extent, part of what I encountered was also because of my color. All right, one of the things that I will mention later on with um, the oral history component is that we have to keep in mind that some communities are skeptical to speak to some members of the community. All right, so African-Americans are 
generally skeptical of whites because they come and they do something and then they leave. Um, the you know veteran community is also very picky about telling their story because they're afraid they're not going to be understood and they're going to be judged by people that don't understand what it's like to be in the military and in that community. So that didn't turn out right. Um, so we did verify that Reuben was buried at Woodlawn Cemetery. Um, I did look at the memorial, and that's why it's kind of like partially here. Um, and his name is not listed on that memorial. And so what we decided to do in 2016, I organized, I got a grant through Broward College to do uh, the MLK Day of Service. So we got money to buy D2 Biological Solution, get a lot of buses, get brushes. Like we got everything and we went out and we cleaned the cemetery. And one of the last things that we did was that we placed that white cross with Reuben Stacy's name next to the pillar that had the S's because we wanted someone to see and come in and say, hey, he's here. In 2019, um, with my African-American history class and my anthropology class at uh, Plantation High School, we were able to get um, the Equal Justice Initiative Museum in Alabama to send us a jar so we can collect soil in honor of Reuben Stacy. And so actually in the picture here, um, we have several trailblazers. The young lady right here is one of the descendants. She was not my student, she's another descendant. Um, Chelsea at this point was already off in college and couldn't make it. Um, in the center here is, was at the time County Mayor Barbara Sharif. And so we have you know, other kind of members from the community, but a lot of kids that were involved in this. And so it was again, like one of those other efforts where we're trying to like, hey, make the community aware of this story. There was no publication aside from the one that we put into the West Side Gazette. We invited a lot of media, nobody came. Um, you know, the kids enjoyed the experience, but I was disappointed because I'm like, man, nobody showed up. You know, like here's a story and nobody came. All right, um, just to kind of show you one of the jars here, this is the jar for Reuben Stacy that's at the museum. And then if you've been to the site, they have the pillars that document kind of the names of the people that were lynched. Now, Broward County only has Reuben Stacy's name on it. One of the problems, again, my hypothesis, is that EJI uses the Tuskegee definition of lynching. And so with all of the um, investigations and stuff that were happening as a result of Reuben's death, correction, Reuben's murder by the sheriff and the deputy sheriff, they changed their MO. So instead of having a public spectacle, they would release a prisoner and shoot him in the back. Oh, he was escaping justifiable homicide. Next. Or people would mysteriously go and commit suicide in the New River with things that are highly improbable to drown someone. And so we've, we've found a couple of people already. We've had a family member that has come and told us, this is my relative. Um, his name is Robert McNair. The uh, Fort Lauderdale Daily News reported him as committing suicide in the New River. He took a five pound sledgehammer, tied it around his neck, and then threw it into the New River. Um, the family's like, no, he was actually a um, labor organizer. So if people needed to have a large quantity of laborers to go to a farm or a grove to harvest, he'd be the one that they would call. And it, the local farmers resented him because he had so much power and he also took a lot of the labor and also, hey, you know what? We're worth more than the price that you wanna pay us. So the family is positive that he was murdered or you know lynched, but we don't have the evidence. And the death certificate for him does show that he was, uh, that Mr. McNair was in Woodlawn Cemetery and it says suicide on the death certificate, but then it also says inconclusive. So I'm like, okay, cool. So putting suicide on a death certificate means that now you cannot claim life insurance. 
So, all right, so I'm gonna kind of like get through Ruben now. So in July, 2020, this is after the, the murder of George Floyd, Broward County for the first time since the lynching, um, Mayor Holness declared July 19th, 2020 as Ruben Stacy Day. It is the first time that anyone in government in Broward County has publicly told the story and raised awareness of it. In June 2021, the city of Fort Lauderdale unanimously approved the secondary renaming of Davy Boulevard. And it goes from 95 all the way west to 441 because that is the area that we can, we can't pinpoint the exact place, but we know somewhere on that road he was lynched. And so they renamed all of it in an effort to again, raise community awareness about Reuben Stacy's lynching. In February, 2022, so just a few months ago, the city unveiled Reuben Stacy Memorial Boulevard. And at that event, um, Ann Navies, the eldest member of Chelsea's family who knew the story and was in the house, actually went up and told the story. I grew up there. He was my uncle. I remember him always coming home and being in a good mood. And she said that she, like, the family did not tell them directly, but the kids knew. They're like, we knew something was wrong. We knew something was off. We didn't know precisely what it was. And it was never talked about. So the big, like, one of the questions that that's, I've, I've been asked is, well, what led to the mayor of Broward County deciding to do this? A commissioner from Parkland, Florida, who was working on his, the history of Parkland and came across the lynching of Reuben Stacy and became involved in wanting to tell this story. So he's a politician. He can easily just call the mayor. Hey, this is what's going on. They had a little workshop that was partially historically correct. Um, and so that's kind of what precipitated this. So, you know, all the efforts that we were doing prior to this man getting involved, but you know, he got it done. Any questions about this? All right. All right, so let's get into a little oral history here. So on Tuesday, the gentleman um, in the middle here with uh, next to me is Sam Fanor. He is a, um, he was a former law enforcement officer for Lauder Hill. He served in the military, did two tours in Iraq. And he is also, the first black brewer and brewery owner in Broward County. And so we invited him to History Fort Lauderdale to collect his story because he's still you know, a fledgling brewery, but he has been highly involved with a lot of the other breweries in Broward and even many in Dade. And one of the main reasons for that is that History Fort Lauderdale received a grant to develop a permanent exhibit of Broward County's black history. And so when the Historical Society got everyone together, community members, the director stacked it where the majority of the members on this advisory board are members of the black community. She goes, no matter how it votes, it's gonna be majority black that are gonna make the decisions. And so one of the things that was asked is, what's the time period and the time period is, you know, Spanish arrival all the way through to as close of today as we can get. So we wanna include current leaders in the black community as much as possible. And Sam is one of those people. And we told him in the interview, I'm like, hey, you don't have a brewery today, but it might change tomorrow. And we don't go to press with this exhibit until June of 2023. So we might get a picture of the brewery, you know, into the exhibit. Um, so one of the things that I would recommend for many of you is to visit the Oral History Association website. Um, they have a lot of resources that will help you kind of like figure out theory and practice. Um, the, you know, for me, the logistics of an oral history program, because I'm coming as like a classroom teacher has always been the thing. It's like, I need to buy recorders. Uh, we're using cassettes. A lot of the oral histories that we took 
were audio only because we could not buy a camera to film it. Um, so, you know, like funding to me is one of those things that's very, very important. Although with our iPhone stuff like that, you could do a voice memo and collect a great oral history now. So, and even the, you know, the cameras on the new phones are spectacular as well. So I've gotten kids to kind of like, hey, use your phone if you want to do the oral history. And that's actually the lesson plan that many of you have now is um, one of the lesson plans that, I, that I've done. Um, so locating interviewees is always the, the difficult thing. I have a project on, you know, the one that we're working on aside from the exhibit for black history is also Broward Brewing History. That's gonna be another oral history project because we got all these breweries popping up and no one's collecting the stories. And we've already had, in Broward, we've had two breweries that have closed. And so who's gonna, you know, like, where are those people and where's their, you know, their name? So collecting objects, but also the stories to go with them. Um, so usually that's difficult. It's either word of mouth or kind of like these days with Sam, it was all through social media. I contacted him through Instagram and um, just, you know, worked out. Um, preparing for the interview is one of the bigger uh, logistical things because you have to develop your questions. You know, in some cases you can improvise if you're already like, well, you're knowledgeable in the area that you want to interview someone about. Um, you know, if I met a veteran at a restaurant, I'd probably pull out my phone, ask permission if I can record them and then take an oral history and just start asking questions. Um, but that's because I'm a veteran. So it's easy for me to be able to just, you know, ad hoc take an oral history. With the black community, it's been, like I said, it's been difficult because some people are skeptical of my intention. Some people don't trust. Um, and in some cases it's taken time. Like I've been doing this for so long in the black community in Broward that they're like, okay, he hasn't left yet. And he's brought a lot of kids and he's, you know, so, you know, I, I've, I've earned, you know, a conversation, but I'm still very protective of my access because it can be taken when they want to. You know, and that's one of the things that I want people to realize is, you know, like we are in a position of trust and this is like a, the anthropologist in me. So, you know, we build the community, we build the relationships. And so, you know, when finding people to interview, we need to be respectful. Um, so one of the big things that I do, and if you look on the back of the packet that I gave you, you'll see a interview protocol. And it's one that I developed with my students in 2021, you're welcome. Who else? Yep. So there you go, there you go. So it's just, it's something that I, we worked on together. And again, this was during the pandemic. So I came across information that Broward County Public Schools was celebrating its 50th anniversary of integration. All right, we were late to the party of integration in, in Broward and in Dade. And so we're in a pandemic, everyone is using Zoom and Microsoft Teams. And I was like, well, we can record. And I was really hoping more for Zoom, but I was like, and we can transcribe with Zoom. So like two of the big things that you need logistically for an oral history interview is like, hey, the transcript, which is always the most difficult part, and then recording it. And so, I got shot down for using Zoom, but then we ended up using Microsoft Teams because that was a district approved, you know, um, teaching tool. And so it was one of those where I would drive to people's homes and give them my cell phone and wait outside in the parking lot while my kids are interviewing these people. Um, it was a lot of fun. The kids really got a lot out of the experience. They learned a lot about their community, a lot about their school. Um, Plantation High School, when schools were integrated, was the only all white school, it was the only non-integrated school. Most of the schools that were integrated had less than 10 black students attending um, the white schools. So it was like a very, very gradual um, process. So like coming up with the interview protocol, preparing for it, doing the research, like what questions do I ask? That's part of that prep that we have to do. And that's one of the things that I had the students do. Um, 
towards the end of the project, one of the students actually like figured out, hey, I can start researching the people that we're interviewing on the internet, and then I can add extra questions. So one of the questions we had um, Dr. Rosalind Osgood, who was a school board member, who agreed to speak to the students. And um, one of my students was like, can I ask her about her um, sorority involvement? Because it seems like she's always wearing pink and green. So I think she's in it, but let's get it on the record. I'm like, okay. And I was like, by the way, her house was actually painted pink and green. I've seen pictures of it. So she said, I'm gonna ask that too. I'm like, go for it. You know. So she had a lot of fun adding in extra questions because she did the work of learning more about the person. So, you know, a lot of that, you know, a lot of the work is front loading, is trying to develop that interview protocol. Once you have it, then you can always continue to build it. You know, the, for the, the interview that we did with Sam, the protocol looks different than this because it was a lot more focused on brewing and owning a brewery. And so in some cases it's like, well, you don't have a brewery, so where do you actually brew your beer that is going out into the different tap, tap rooms in the county? So he's actually renting a space in Hialeah to actually brew his beer. So, you know, some of the questions I threw out because they're not relevant, but that's the luxury in it. If you notice, that's one of his bottles of beer. Just came out about a week and a half ago. So we actually, opened it and shared it. So everybody had a little taste of Sam's Stout. And so that was one of the things. So now that beer bottle is now part of the collection as well and now helps tell Sam's story. So, you know, it, the interview, once you have the comfort level and the familiarity with it, it's really easy. It's, you're having a conversation. The Jackie, this young lady over here, She's a, an intern at the Historical Society. She actually has a lot of experience. Um, she was out of the Proctor Oral History Lab at UF, and she did the Veteran History Project. And um, she, she was like, yeah, I've done the, the veteran interview. So as I'm going through and we're interviewing, and I'm like, oh, can you say that name again? And can you spell it for me? Like little things that when you sit there and you do the transcripts, like, oh, I wish I would have asked that. You know, she goes, I really appreciate that you did that because that's always a pain in the neck, especially when somebody has a nuanced name. So for the day of the interview, um, if you recall when we had Anne Marie, the photo of them interviewing the Bellamy family, she had the, um, you know, the interview protocol. We had the index of Woodlawn. We had, you know, some other research notes and stuff like that all there to help support her as part of the process. And so that's kind of how you want to prepare for your interview is have your materials there. Um, I personally like bring a, a, a little like rolly cart with books because sometimes I'm like, oh, you said something that reminded me of something in a book. And so it's like, I don't have the books. So I can't add, you know, so I usually like, grab the book and include that in the, the oral history. So, um, but the day of the interview tends to be a lot of fun. Like I'm still like happy about Tuesday, you know. And then finally, like the post interview activities, this is where we get into like logistics of where are you gonna store it? How is it gonna be published? Are you gonna use it for another work? Um, are you gonna transcribe it? And so, you know, those are, you know, other things that need to be considered also, especially in advance for us. And as you can see with the lesson plan, I knew from the beginning we needed written consent. And so that was one of the first things. I'm like, we need written consent. After we did the first couple of interviews, one of the um, curators for the Broward County Historical Commission said, you know, you should really put the consent on the tape as well. That way they can't say that it wasn't asked. And if we have the full tape, then it's there on the record. And so when the paper gets lost or destroyed or whatever, it's still on tape that they said yes. And so then I added the, the preamble to my interviews is this is Roberto Fernandez interviewing, um, you know, Paul Carlson at the historic uh, police station and courthouse in Overtown, Florida. Paul, do I have your permission to record this interview? And it's there. And in some cases you don't get to it in the beginning because you, ha you have someone that comes in and presents and you kind of throw it in at the end. Hey, do I have your permission to record this? Yeah, absolutely. If you make any money on it, I want to cut. Okay, turn it off, you know? So I did have someone do that. They were an attorney. I was like, but um, 
you know, so you want to kind of make sure that you have that written in. And that's evident on the transcript that I gave you, um, that including the consent. Um, so some ethical issues. One of the things that kind of immediately happened when we started doing interviews is there were things that people were willing to share with me on the record and things that people were like, okay, can we have a, you know, like I turned off the recorder and then, okay, so here's off the record. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people in the black community did not want to mention their issues with Sheriff Walter Clark or his brother, Robert Clark. There is still a lingering fear of the reach of those men. So much so that people, you know, in, in all of the interviews that I did, and at, at that point it was about 50, there was only one person that went on the record and called them out. It was Robert and Walter Clark, the sheriff and the deputy sheriff. They were the ones going around harassing the black community, beating us, forcing us to go to somebody's farm and work for the day to work off our fines for the court. Um, and so for me, a lot of the off the record conversations, you know, like for many journalists, it becomes a, a guidepost like, hey, now I need to find evidence to prove the story that they can't tell me, but that way I have the evidence to prove it. And so with so many people and it's like, I, I've gone back and asked like, would you still wanna go on the record and talk about the sheriff? No, okay. So, you know, respect, you know, respect the privacy of what they're giving you. Um, doesn't matter if they're black or Native American. I know with, with the Seminoles, there's knowledge that they share and then they have people sign non-disclosure agreements. Um, for most of us, we won't have an NDA that we have to sign after a conversation, but be respectful because that could also impact other members of the community that come after you to talk to these community members. Um, and then consent, again, you know, get a form. The forms that are included in the packet were reviewed by a, the city attorney of Davie. I actually like said to him, like, you're the only lawyer that will do this for free for me because I know you. And so he reviewed them, he goes, they're good the way that you have them. Um, and he goes, the only thing that he recommended was as the teacher, like make sure your signature is there too. Because at the end of the day, you're still the one in charge of everything. So, um, Going into the, all right, so you have the handouts. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to help, to offer advice, to show up and interview with you, um, especially if you've never done this before. Um, I'm more than happy to help. And thank you.